Hello, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to get the chance to present here today with this about this small featurette regarding the Upper Canadian Militia and their uniforms during the War of 1812. This is based on an article that was featured in the most recent issue, the second volume, in fact, uh, of the Yorker Gazette, which is available to read online at uh, www.secondyork.com. Uh, it's a brilliant volume, and I recommend checking out if you haven't gotten the chance. It has many brilliant, well-researched and intriguing pieces covering a wide variety of subjects uh, that I think will appeal to everyone. Today we're doing, uh, we're zoning in on one, however, theme that was covered uh, within the journal, and this is this history regarding uniforms. Uh, something that I believe is important to understand, not just from a historical sense, to really trace the evolution of the militia during the War of 1812 uh, into sort of becoming, or as rather envisioning it into becoming a, a more professional, regimental looking military body. But it's also important to understand from a living history and reenactment perspective. When you see Second York out on the field, you'll often see it fielding its uh, iconic green uniform with red faces, the red collars and cuffs. Uh, but of course, these uniforms uh, we arrived on after careful deliberation and research for years uh, regarding what the appearance of the ideal militia would look like during the War of 1812. And it only really tells one chapter of what is a rather broad and complex story regarding efforts to uniform the militia and clothe it during the War of 1812. A uh, history that begins before the war itself even, uh, because the Upper Canadian Militia itself was established as a defensive organ in the 1790s. Of course, there were fears at the time of an American invasion, uh, fears that were just as real as they were uh, before the War of 1812 occurred. And so the militia were intended to be sort of a defensive cornerstone locally, uh, should such an American invasion ever become a reality. Despite this, though, there weren't really many, uh, weren't really many efforts to try and actually uniform the militia during this time period. And so the militia maintained a largely civilian appearance uh, before the war and during the early war period itself. When the militia were called out to muster, which was the annual training uh, that they did, uh, they would often come out in just in their civilian attire, their coats, their trousers, their uh, felt top hats. Uh, often the only people who were expected to have a uniform and really could get a uniform were officers uh, who had the wealth and the time to be able to have their uniforms properly tailored. The ordinary citizen soldier, though, uh, just came out in his civilian clothing. And this carried into even the course of the early war, because once the war had broken out, the militia did not have a uniform still uh, in any official capacity or unofficial one. Uh, and so as a result, the militia, when it came out, came out in civilian attire, once again, uh, and the, oftentimes the only thing to distinguish it out on the field as belonging to the Canadian militia and thus to the uh, British army were simple uh, white bands that were often worn either around the arm or sometimes even around uh, the hat itself. Uh, of course, this wouldn't persist for long. There was a push towards trying to uniform the militia and give it a more military appearance uh, as its importance increased over the course of the war. Uh, it's something that began first on an ad hoc and unofficial basis, as we can observe at the Siege of Fort Detroit, which was this really significant critical battle uh, that occurred in August of 1812, in which uh, General, Major General Sir Isaac Brock undertook this ambitious gambit to siege the American fort of Detroit on the west bank of the Detroit River. And of course, he had with him a force of uh, Redcoats regulars of the uh, 41st Regiment, as well as indigenous allies uh, to the Crown and uh, militia too. Now, the militia at the siege of Fort Detroit were actually given uh, excess sort of coats from the uh, 41st Regiment, redcoats that were no longer in use among them, called castoffs. Uh, now, these uh, these coats were issued to the militia on the part of Brock, of course, as a ruse. Uh, he intended to use this to fool the American garrison into thinking he had a larger force of regulars than he actually did. For the militia, though, this wasn't a bad deal. Given that all they had at this time were civilian uniforms, this was really the first unofficial uniform that was given to them. And it set this important precedent of giving castoffs, giving uh, uniforms that were sort of grandfathered uh, to the militia from regular, uh, regular red coat army regiments and given to them second hand. Uh, now, of course, this was still an unofficial stipulation, and this was something that was really reserved to the militia who had come with Brock to the siege. This wasn't something that was, of course, province-wide across to the rest of the militia. Uh, 
but the first effort to officially uniform the militia, to give the militia an official uniform coat T, uh, was in 1813. Uh, actually in January, 1st of January of 1813, uh, when this sweeping period of uh, reforms arrived to try and reorganize the militia. And of course, part of this was giving the militia a uniform that had a distinctly military appearance. Now, uh, the one who passed the reforms, uh, Sir George Prevo, uh, who was the governor general and commander of the British forces in Upper Canada, uh, he actually intended for the militia not to receive this code originally. <laughs> Uh, he intended for them to receive a red coat faced blue. Uh, the difficulty he had, though, is that this, there was no red available, red wool and red dye available to actually manufacture these uniforms locally. And if you wanted to get them, you had to have them shipped from Britain, which is rather arduous given the precarious uniform situation. And so as a result, it was settled that there would be this stopgap uniform, this uniform in green with white lace, these white tabs that run down the middle of the coat, red cuffs, collars, and shoulder boards. Now the distinct and iconic uniform uh, uh, that the second New York wears to represent uh, the official militia uniform during the War of 1812. Uh, of course, this uniform was made to use red as sparingly as possible. It was used, of course, along the collars and cuffs, and green was what made up the majority uh, of the color of the coat. Now, this uniform was officially issued on the 1st of January of 1813, but it took until the spring of 1813 for these uniforms to actually arrive. And it's likely that these uniforms, I don't think we know for certain, but it's likely that they were manufactured out in lower Canada, in Quebec, actually. Uh, because, of course, this was intended to be a stopgap uniform. It's something that had to be locally made, could be quickly transported to the troops in Upper Canada. At the same time, uh, Upper Canada didn't really have a wide cloth manufacturing infrastructure to make these coats en masse. Uh, and if they did uh, at least make a few of these coats, it's likely the numbers would have been small and rather negligible uh, within the big picture of the uniform situation. Uh, now, this coat, when it actually began to arrive, there weren't, of course, many. The supply situation was still rather precarious. Uh, and so for those Canadian militia who did get it, they often tended to be priority. Uh, so militia who, were, who often saw active combat. So the newly created and incorporated militia was likely one that received a number of these coats. And we know that they did. Uh, it was intended to be a more full-time professional militia body, as well as the flank companies uh, of militia companies, uh, of, of militia. Uh, likely received uh, these coats as well, these official uniform coats. The majority of militia, however, likely didn't really have uh, a uniform to wear. Most would have still had to make do with either their civilian clothing or with the various alternatives and substitutes that may have been available to them. Now, there were a number of these alternatives. We've already gone over one, and it's these cast-off coats, these uh, coats that could be forwarded from oftentimes from red-coated regiments, but they were sometimes even forwarded from uh, lower Canada militia who were no longer in use for them. There's a number of recorded cases. The 103rd Regiment was said to have given a number of cast-off coats to the militia. The 89th Regiment was one that was supposed to do the same, although its coats were re-diverted towards another unit called the Michigan Fencibles. And there's also various other cases of Lower Canada militia doing so, and likely also various unrecorded cases of uh, coats being given secondhand uh, to militia. As you can imagine, these coats weren't brand new. Uh, these were coats that oftentimes had been worn, had been considered unfit for circulation. And so uh, as such, when they arrived to the militia, they weren't in the best of condition. But oftentimes, many militia had to make do with what was available. And this was usually a better alternative to having uh, no uniform at all. Uh, still, a better alternative for most militia, though, was actually the gray greatcoat. Uh, it was this long gray greatcoat that often tend, that was rugged and simple and often locally manufactured. There was records of it being locally made in Upper Canada. And a number of them many of them, in fact, were issued to the Upper Canada Militia over the course of the war, and they were actually quite uh, popular, and they were a largely acceptable substitute for the lack of having either a cast-off uniform or for having uh, you know, the official green uniform. Uh, by the by 1814, there was actually even a new stipulation to alter the uniform, it seemed, uh, for the Upper Canadian Militia, a uniform in red faced green. 
uh, considering the fact that the green uniform was what was widely available and what was being made, though, uh, these uniforms weren't necessarily intended to be a direct substitute, but rather something to supplant uh, or sort of to, to uh, supplement, uh, not supplant, uh, the green uniform, which was uh, circulating still among the militia. Of course, the uniform supplies were rather valuable, and so they couldn't afford to just toss out all these coats and replace them with new ones. Uh, it's likely that these red coats weren't actually issued in that large of a number, however, and they weren't that common. We're told that near the end of the war, even around mid-1814 or so, that there was even a new stipulation for the coat that Prevo originally wanted, the red coat faced blue. Uh, it's likely that this coat was never actually issued, however, or at least if it ever was, it was a highly uncommon sight on the field. And so it's doubtful that it would have been available. Now, by the end of the war, in terms of appearance, the militia seemed like it was this hodgepodge. Uh, there were a number, who, of course, who many who still had their civilian clothing. There were some who had uh, the official green uniform. There were a number who had cast off uniforms, anything that was available and that was seconded to them, and a number who wore substitutes like great coats. Uh, the militia, the uniform situation over the course of the war for the militia was rather precarious, given that Canada itself was a rather peripheral theater and that the militia was quite low on the supply totem pole. But still, uh, all these uniforms really reflected, or black thereof, really reflected the uh, desire to turn the militia and evolve it into a more professional military body, not just in terms of organization and composition and role, but also in terms of giving it a more professional and regimental appearance to integrate it into the British military apparatus, so to speak, even if just in terms of appearance. Uh, the likelihood that they succeeded, uh, well, doesn't appear to be very probable, but all the same, this is a very interesting history. Uh, and through this really complex web, a complex web of supplies and uniforms that were circulating across Upper Canada. Uh, there was, there's a rather interesting history here uh, of this push to turn the militia into a more professional body, not just a citizen army, but a military looking citizen army. Thank you very much for your time.